You started the stream? I just clicked start stream just now. This last uh, second. Okay, we need to stop talking about how much we hate uh, Dota Alchemy viewers and stream viewers in particular, especially the ones that show up right at the start of streams. They're the worst. The kind absolute of people. worst. The absolute worst. But we're not going to obviously talk about that because that would be fucked up to do on, on stream. Yeah, I mean, to take the words right out of Trent, they're the lowest of the low, right? They're, they're, they're yeah. lower than Bulldog viewers or the people who tune into our streams. Yeah. Yeah, I've been saying like Saddam level, just like Saddam Hussein. Oh, just kind of, and and that's that's really to me, that's how I see these these people. That's a yikes from me. But you're not streaming, so it's no it's no big deal. Oh right, right, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely start the stream when I get back from making my tea. So just you know, get all of your racism and bigotry out now. Okay, I have so much bigotry. I've been okay. waiting to bigot. Cool. I'll be right back. Okay. Oh, man. I hate people that have different ideas than me. Oh, especially people that have different cultures than I do. <laughs> yeah, what up, boys? That was uh, an exacerbated. Is that, that's a word, right? That's a word. Like, is it exacerbated or exacerbated? I feel like one of those uh, sounds like you're stroking your penis. And the other one doesn't. But that was a long joke. I'm done now. The joke is over. Hello, Cake. C. Krom. What's up? What's up, Zen? Zhen? Can you tell me how to pronounce X? I, I never, I can never pronounce X right when it's, when it's in these names. Damn, the stream is laggy for me. You just came back from an intentionally feeding teammate. That is rare because usually they keep feeding and then you lose the game. It's very sad. Pudge is a mid hero? Pudge is a garbage hero. Sup, Bong Slayer? How's it going? I had two nicknames in university one, Pussy Slayer, and two, The Bong King. So your name is just a combination of both of those, of both of my nicknames. Uh, that didn't exist in university. Do the judge vids again. I will. People ask for those. They didn't get that many views. I think the thumbnail probably sucked. Maybe we need to make the thumbnail better. I had fun. Ma I had fun doing that one. Hey guys. Oh, I'm hearing a dog. Vinceptor, what up? Get a question in today, Vince? Oh, you did. We're getting so many good questions these days, actually. It's insane. These these podcasts have been going on for a long time, but not not in a bad way. I mean, I guess from, maybe from a viewer standpoint, but from a me standpoint, I'm really enjoying the questions that people are asking. They're super good. Do I think OG Seed is good, Jenkins? Um, I'm a, I'm a little, I'm a little biased because I really, really, really like Z Freak. He's a really cool guy. I met him at Midas mode and we hung out a lot and had a really good time. And, uh, so I want him to do well. And I think that he's a Dota genius. So I don't care about the other guys, but Z Freak's a, that guy's a god. Yo, what up? I'm back. Hey, Betty. Tier two team next season. Are you asking me if I'm going to play on a Tier 2 team? Or if OG Seed is going to be a Tier 2 team? You look good in that, Donnie. In what? The shirt. Dude, it's Dead Alchemy merch. It sounds like I'm I'm trying to sell our merch, but can you even buy that anymore? I don't think you yeah. can, right? Yeah, you can. Oh, you can? Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. You look good with a clean shave. Somebody said that last time. When you get random compliments on the internet, you know that it's you know that they're right. <laughs> People usually just insult. Sure. Sure. Yeah, it's it's annoying though because I have to shave all over again because it's just prickly on my face. Well, yeah. It's the worst part about shaving is that you have to do it like every day or every other day. 
You know, I was I was thinking about that, but if you if you grow like a goatee, don't you need to shave it uh, anyway? Like, isn't that just the yeah, same thing? I mean, you can kind of let it just get scruff and then trim it up a little bit with a beard trimmer, which is what I usually do. No, don't do that, man. Go go one or the other. You gotta go scruff, or you gotta go fully shaved. That's that's what the ladies like. <laughs> is that? You speak? Does cat like the goatee? Yeah. She does. Yeah. She likes the fuzzy feeling on her chin. <laughs> I don't know about that, when, but she likes. When you guys help. are when you guys are Eskimo kissing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, don't you? <clears throat> you would know. Uh, what was that? Huh? Oh, what? Nothing. Hello? Sorry. <laughs> Jenkins, why didn't you try it for the LA Major Open qualifiers? Would you believe I actually had an interview with Val? Uh, they told me to fuck off though, which is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did actually have a Valve interview, yeah. and uh, I so I I dipped out of those. But they they basically told me that I'm probably too shit of a programmer to work there, which is you know pretty reasonable, I think. Bong Slayer, that's a hell of a name. Yeah, I had it. I'm pretty happy that they even considered me. I thought they were gonna ghost me. How did I screw that up? Well, I have like three or four total years of programming experience, and they said that. They basically hire people with ten plus years, so I, I I guess I need to get better. It's like Dota two. Sometimes you know, people can say that they can probably oh I could play in pro matches, but they couldn't. But that's okay because at at some point you know you keep practicing, you get high MMR, and then you can. That's just how it is. Yep. You can't. You don't think you can play an ancient when you're legend, but then when you're ancient, it's just all fine and dandy. Yeah. Very true. Very true. I mean. You know, there's a lot of success stories out there, people who just keep putting in the effort, and then it just works out, and you create your own luck a lot of the time. That's all it is, man. That's really all it is, I think. Yep. I think every success story starts with some, usually it's some rock bottom, then it's like failure after failure after failure, and then some success, modicum of success. That's just like, people always... uh. It's it's really weird because people definitely like fantasize and glo and glorify uh, fantasize about and glorify the like success at the end of the hard work, mm -hmm. but not the hard work itself. So we have this really weird, um, you know, you watch like Wolf of Wall Street or some shit like that. Um, well, actually, I haven't seen that movie, so I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I really shouldn't reference it. But <laughs> that movie is a clown fiesta, anyway. But it's I... <laughs> it's just it's just that like I, all the all the movies and shows. It's like it shows us like the process and doesn't show like how brutal and shit it is. Yeah, it, it shows like the like... results of the process. I mean, even right. somebody like Doctor Disrespect. This is sort of like a weird example, but if you look at his old, if you look at his YouTube channel and you scroll all the way back, like nine years ago when he was posting videos, or seven years ago, or whatever it was. There are some weird ass videos, but they were still in Dr. Disrespect persona. Like he's been doing this persona for like almost a decade now on the internet. Well, I guess, I mean, I guess as an example, um, I, you know, I don't consider us to be as successful as Dr. Disrespect or something like that, but I'm, I'm very happy with how far we've come. Um, and it was fucking brutal. It was so brutal. I didn't think that we could even do a YouTube channel. I legitimately thought that that was like a bad idea. I remember originally that was like – you said like, okay, let's just do it for free. And I, I thought you were crazy. <laughs> and uh, legitimately, I was like, that, that's, there's no fucking way that that will be financially viable. We won't get any views. I just I – just had never, I had never done it. And for a while, it was true. Uh, but then eventually, we just took down the site. We we're basically just a Game Leap competitor. We took down the site, and we're just a YouTube channel now. Yeah, and uh, we've been going strong for two years almost. It's yeah, crazy. It's been it's been two years, and and that's one of the other crazy things is like, I think both you and I occasionally get really depressed about the fact that we're not like two hundred fifty thousand, you know, five hundred thousand subs or or stuff like that. We're not like this massive, massive channel that you see these other people who are like you know, really influencers. We're just you know. We're eighty thousand, which is a lot in terms of That's like respectable. in terms of like the grand scheme of things, but it doesn't sound like that much when you compare it to other people. And that's where the comparison stuff is where you really start to like 
well go into the, the deep the dark side of, of things that don't really matter right the problem is though the problem is you're always comparing from like your current pr perspective because yeah. if you told me if you told me two years ago that i would have a youtube channel that had eighty thousand subscribers i i legit i legitimately wouldn't believe you like i i, I didn't wouldn't even think that was possible because like i watched youtube channels with eighty thousand subscribers you know like i look up right. to I've done that since I was, you know, I was part of the generation that watched YouTube as fucking fucking socialization instead of going to parties. And, you know, it's like, so it's, I would, I wouldn't have believed you. So it's like, yeah, with the, with the current perspective, you, you like, you look at what you have and you're like, I, I wish I had more sometimes. Yeah. But then also it's like, if you view it from the perspective of having nothing, then it's like, I'm pretty goddamn grateful for what I've got, you know, same yeah. thing goes for like, even just. I even just have that – getting super off topic here, but I even have that same uh, epiphany sometimes just having a roof over my head. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll think like, man, I just passed a guy on the street that was like living in a cardboard box in Canada in the, the heart of winter. You know, like this guy is going to get his fucking toe amputated tomorrow because he has frostbite because right. it's too cold. And, and here I am, and yeah, my rent's expensive, and, you know, the economy's crashing or whatever, but fuck, man, I have a place to live. I have a cozy bed. It's a nice bed. I have comfortable covers. Like, I'm alive. There's plenty of people dying of cancer and shit. Like, I'm alive. I have good health. Like, all of these things, I feel like it's just perspective. It's just perspective. And there's a balance because I do think that, like, anxiety, depression, all of these things are good motivators, but uh, sometimes, like, you actually need to give your, yourself the space to just, like, feel comfortable with where you're at. Because too yep. much of these like motivators just prevents you from doing anything at all. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Getting too caught up in like what's next instead of just like being here. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a balance of like present, future, and, and you know, to some degree past. I've definitely had the thing where you like post a video, it gets really good views. You spend so much time like jerking off to the fact that, that video was so sick. Right. And then the next one is like, oh it's two weeks later you don't have you don't have a video or you've just made like garbage content and it's just because you're like focusing on like that that one that one video that one success and the same thing goes for like tournaments i think we've talked we talked about this before in the podcast but like you know you can have a team like win a major and then they'll play in the next qualifier and they'll play like dog shit because they're still excited they're still motivated from that major win they're like we don't need to try hard Right. We don't need to experience we're better than everybody. Heroes. Like we just proved that we're the best team in the world, so we just don't really have to try just that. Just play, hard. just show yeah. up and play Dota instead of innovating. And I think I think Nigma uh recently, uh, you know, maybe they would disagree and maybe I'm just reaching, but I feel like they're similar in the sense that like they'll you know, they don't they don't qualify for anything, you know, they don't qualify for a major and then they win was it Dota Pit? And then they like win Dota Pit or get second place. I don't remember what happened, but they, they did really well in the in the next in the next tournament that they got invited to, right? So it's like, right after coming second or winning the major, was it? What did they win the major? I don't remember. They came like second or something. Yeah, they were they were second in the major to secret, and then they bombed out Lost of the qualifiers, the and then they showed up at we play and then beat secret in a five game series. So it's yeah, like, it's yeah, like yeah. they're on, they're off, they're on, they're off, they're on, they're off, and that's the problem with not having the balance. You know, obviously they fix it pretty quickly because they're, they're professionals. Good. <laughs> yeah, because they're good. That's why the whole the whole Reddit circle jerk of like a team loses or somebody makes a bad play, it's like worst player ever, terrible player. And it's just like that's just not how it works. You have to look at like the overall history. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's uh, it's a lot more complicated than it seems. Uh, okay, you wanna get into the old the old questions? One sec, let me get a diet coke extra. Uh, it's toasted vanilla flavor. <laughs> yeah, are you there? Yeah, did you um did you post in Discord that we're live? Sir? Oh, that's that's uh Yeah, one job! One job, Andrew. Don't yell at me. One job. Just pull the Can lane. I say something? Just Can pull I say the something? fucking lane. Yeah? Go ahead. For all the soda, for all the soda fans out there, 
I always mention in, in videos that I drink Diet Dr. Pepper and Diet Do Dr. Pepsi and everything like that. And everybody's like, oh, Coke's the real drink. Pepsi's the real drink. But whatever it is, it's always the other one. Right. I like both. They're interchangeable to me. I, I like all diet soda. I'm not going to lie to you. I have not had a diet soda that I haven't enjoyed. Diet Mountain Dew, a lot of people think that's dog shit. I like that. I like <laughs> Diet Sprite. I like Diet Coke. I like Diet Coke Extra, which is only available in Canada, which is toasted vanilla flavor uh, with extra caffeine in it. I you thought know, you I were like off all... that stuff. You are telling me that it gave you like a heart attack like well, last no, week okay. or some shit. <laughs> it, was, it was rotting my teeth. But uh, I went to the dentist, and the dentist cleaned it. So, ah, so you just need to go back soon again. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. I'm addicted to the fake sugar. No, it's <laughs> not an addiction. It's just that I have a psychological impulse and requirement for the fake sugar. That's not an addiction. I just don't get a dopamine rush, and I don't feel full. I don't feel whole if I don't have the di the diet sugar. That's not an addiction. Yeah, I agree. That's, you know, it does ruin my life, and I do get really angry at people and have bad behavior whenever I don't have it. But I don't know. That's not an addiction. Yeah, I agree. Okay, let's get into the questions. All right. You want to roll the intro this time, or you want me to do it? Hello, friends. Welcome to Alchemy Answers, level 70, where we answer your questions if you pay us on patreon.com slash dota alchemy also we have a new benefit for anyone who joins the patreon ranks of our our acolytes our alchemist acolytes is that uh at the end of the month we're going to be doing an exclusive patreon only stream where you get to choose what heroes jenkins and i play in a duo queue session a du duo queue stream what are we gonna do like four games or something like that maybe We'll, I don't know, we'll see how long. Time. Yeah, we'll see how long it it goes. We'll see how fun it is. Uh, but you guys will get to vote and choose our heroes and our roles. So if you want to make me play Pudge and Jenkins laugh at me while he's also playing uh, Techies, or you know, what's your least favorite hero in the game? Lion. Yes, we'll do a Pudge Lion lane, and you'll have to play Lion, and I'll play Pudge. I don't mind playing Lion. I actually don't. <laughs> least favorite hero. Least favorite hero. To play, I mean, it would have to be something boring. Honestly, I'm, I'm a, pr I'm fine with playing obscure heroes as long as they're fun. It would need to be something boring. Like, mm, let's see, God, Lich is pretty fucking boring. That's true. Um, Venge. Ugh. Oh yeah, Vengeful something. Spirit Pudge. That sounds like a game-winning combo right there. You swap them towards me, and then I point blank hook them because I can't hit anything longer than a point blank hook. Sound good? Yeah, I don't know. There's <laughs> honestly it's hard there's it's hard to find a hero in Dota that I wouldn't that I wouldn't enjoy playing. I yeah. like the game. I like the game, man. I'm really gonna be honest. Game. Right now, it, I'd be hard pressed to not enjoy a single hero because I'm having a lot of fun playing Dota. Even when I lose, I'm having fun. I I'm really trying to I'm really trying to think about it. I feel like I feel like I could make almost anything work. Um I mean, I'd play, probably play like dog shit if you give me something like Anti Mage, but Anti Mage Pudge, that's the lane. Oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna get an Oove, just beat their ass. Yeah, you have to play the four. I get to play the three, because I'm of the course. off laner in this relationship. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, starting with the questions. <laughs> Hawk Illionaire says, "Is it actually possible to stack the Radiant Camp, the Ancients, more than once?" I don't think I've ever pulled it off. Dire side is easy as fuck. I can stack it 10 times. I have seen people stack it up to three times. So I would assume so. I don't spend a lot of time stacking it because I'm an offlaner and I'm busy feeding on the enemy side of the map. But I have seen people like three stack it. Uh, maybe yeah. you need to cut some trees. You definitely can. Uh, you can... I don't know if you're using like the Dota Plus cues to to pull but you can definitely cue you can pull the camp in multiple different directions so experiment with that because you can pull it directly sideways back towards radiant base you can pull it over to the small camp and you can pull it straight up which is what dota plus recommends but that's actually the farthest out of the spawn Dude, box so i gotta say the dota plus cues to pull are garbage they're not Hot very garbage. good they're not very they good 
like a lot of the time they just don't work. They yeah. just straight up don't work at the timing that they tell you, or it's or it's like. 0.5 seconds, a 0.5 second window at the timing that they say. Right. You usually That's... need to do slightly earlier than all of them. Which kind of defeats the entire purpose. <laughs> right. Of... Exactly. So, yeah, maybe cut some trees. Don't follow Dota Plus. It's a liar. Uh, Mira says, there was a game where I was positioned for Rubik and around the 10 to 15 mark, our safe lane tier one was being pushed in by a solo Wind Ranger. I went there and sat there clearing five to six waves, getting experience, but in the back of my head, I felt like I should be with my team. In the end, I think it was the correct thing to do because we ended up keeping the tower alive for a long time. Any thoughts on a conflicting situation like this? So I would need to see the game, yeah. but uh, often if you can do that, it's it's usually pretty fine. Uh, the thing is, like, I guess the question is, can you actually group up with your team and, and do stuff? Or is it is it like necessary? You know, because... If if your if your team just doesn't want to fight and you're doing that that that's good or if like you want to bait fights around that tower that's that's fine uh, but if if like you know the enemy team is like owning on the other side of the map and you have some hero that you really need to defend over there like some alchemist or something then yeah you you probably don't want to be doing that you it it just depends on what's important in the game but I would say in most games that's fine just make sure that when you're holding that lane it's like because you don't want to fight and you're just you're just uh stalling so yeah. if you're not in a situation where you need to stall then you uh then you don't need to do that i'd also say pay very close attention to how many heroes time you're occupying because if you're trading your time for three heroes time or something like that that's always going to be good but if it's just like you de pushing against like a tide hunter or something like that who doesn't have ravage then that's probably wasting your time and you could be better served like going with your team to go fight so um try and try and make sure that you are aware of like exactly how much space you're making don't just assume that you're making it yeah putsy mccoy says just pick kunkka and press q at 57 seconds oh that's a stack it's a hockey laner yeah yeah sdfs 25 says how do i play clinks mid against an invoker typically clinks's game plan is to give up early cs in exchange for harass to zone him off later waves. What should my game plan be against him? Also, uh, how should we play against Exhort Invoker in general? Well, I got good news for you. I think Invoker is a pretty garbage hero. So basically, as long as you don't feed him, uh, you're going to be fine. So I would say against Invoker, there is not all that much benefit in trading uh, trading CS to harass him. You should just focus on CSing because he has Quas the moment he gets level 3. He can have a permanent tango, more than a permanent tango going. So I wouldn't bother. Uh, but he does have pretty low armor. So, you know, in situations where, let's say you pick up like an early two Wraith Bands or something, you know, you can cut, you can cock block him off the wave. You can do stuff like that by, by threatening to kill him. But it's not like you're going to slowly harass him down and then kill him. You're just going to prevent him from coming up to the wave. So, like, I would say you can still keep harassing. It's just don't do it and sacrifice CS in, in order to do it. You would just play that lane uh, a little bit more like like normal, and you can use your Searing Arrows to get last hits. Feel free to do that. As long as you're getting farm, you're fine. Yeah, I agree. I, I also think that you could potentially... Because Clink is a hero who is always at risk of being shoved under tower. He's like one of the worst heroes at dealing with hero with creeps under tower. So if you just like kill the range creep every single wave early then your wave will push into invoker's tower and then you can hit invoker while he's trying to last it under tower with his terrible base damage yeah that sounds pretty good that sounds de definitely pretty good i mean you eat you eat a creep too right so you can just eat the range creep. yeah fair enough actually that's probably the way to go is just eat the range creep every wave and then just punch the invoker yeah i don't, I don't see that as like a particularly hard lane for clinks honestly i think uh I think if you like overcommit to harassing him or act like a little bitch, both of those situations are going to get you. Uh, he might he might outlane you, but if you're just playing aggressive and harassing normally, like when he walks up and he's hitting, going for a last hit, things like that, I think I think you'll keep him at like low enough HP that he won't be able to destroy you. Speaking of that, what's the viability of offlane clinks eating a creep behind the tower at level one? Uh, like like Doom style. <laughs> 
my my so i have other problems with offlane clinks like i feel like that's fine that's good mm -hmm. but like what does he offer as an offlaner in the rest of the game you know he doesn't yeah. push waves he's not tanky he's strictly a damage dealer in a role that's not going to be getting very much farm you're basically just picking a carry in the offlane yes who's better <laughs> speed or jenkins speed okay um somebody said we don't read youtube Wait. chat at, we do at, read YouTube chat. It's at just... Fortnite? Is, are you oh, better sorry. Than... I, th I, I thought you were talking about Fortnite. At Dota, definitely me, because he doesn't even play Dota, so... Yeah. Definitely me. Yeah. Uh, I, two... okay. What? I was just going to say, I just wanted to make sure that we answered that one correctly. Yeah, right. Of course. Of course. Uh, okay. Putsy McCoy says, with Strength Heroes being meta position four at the moment, would you guys say that the beefy area control heroes offer the best toolkits for position four? Is there still room for intelligence position fours in the ideal lineup. Uh, in my opinion, I, I think that like a lot of the time your position four and position three are kind of interchangeable. Like if so if you have some like Rubik as a position four, a lot of the time it's really nice to have a you know centaur or an earthshaker or something like that as a position three. So as long as your draft has uh, enough team fight and control and like a beefy hero, then you can pick those intelligence position fours. Like for example, if you have a DK mid, uh, then you can pick like Rubik Lashrak as your offlane, and that's fine because both of those heroes offer a decent amount of control. You know, they're they're not totally out of the left field. It's not like Rubik is a completely different hero than something like an Earth Spirit. They both have lockdown. They both have damage. They're both good at team fighting. Um, but then your DK offers you that kind of guy to run in first and start fights and has a disable you know he's a team fighting disabler guy so it just depends on what your other heroes are sven is similar in the position one if you have a sven maybe you don't need as much beefcake on your team and you can you can start to think okay maybe i'm going to pick an intelligence position four but mostly it's the offlane like if you have a centaur feel free to pick a disruptor pause four feel free to pick a, a pause four rubik something like that yeah i mean we're seeing shadow shaman coming back into the meta to some extent we're seeing like like you said, Disruptor, obviously. Um, I mean, I would almost even throw Nyx Assassin into that role because the hero is so terrible in lane. He's like, he's basically a squishy ant hero because he doesn't do very much. Yeah, people just pick Nyx and get boots and drag two waves constantly. That's all <laughs> yeah. I'm seeing these days. Yeah. Which which is quite quite good. Uh, Phoenix, actually. I saw GH was spamming Phoenix. That hero has hmm. been picked 500 times in the last week on Dota 2 Pro Tracker. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, Phoenix is getting picked. I have noticed it in my games quite a bit. Pretty cool. Uh, Uga Chaka says, I have a 60% win rate on Fridays, but only a 38% win rate on Thursdays, uh, with about 50 matches played in total for each day. Does this prove that Thursday is the most depressing day that I shouldn't play Dota on Thursdays, or is there not enough data to tell? Dude, I would actually say, I don't know. That's, uh, that's that a lot of... That seems somewhat significant to me. What is going on? Are you just super happy on Fridays? You're like, yes, I don't have to work. It's a weekend. I don't know, man. I want to actually look at mine because I definitely noticed that I had a much worse win rate on weekends. On Saturday and Sunday at one point, I noticed that that was a uh, pretty significant decrease in my ability to win games yeah i i have similar thoughts except that past 3 a.m if i if i queue at 3 a.m it's just yeah fuck that's like geez i have like 30 percent win rate past 3 a.m it's 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 not good it's really not good so i don't know i would i would say look into that figure out like what the hell it is that's different on thursdays and and fridays um and if there's nothing then it's probably bullshit you know, it's probably just some some statistical anomaly, which, uh, which is which is fine. You know that happens, but I would I would definitely look into that a little bit. Yeah, you should just create a spreadsheet and track it for yourself. Figure it out. Yep, yep. Your mic wall, please fix it. Thanks. Is it my mic? Does my mic sound like dog shit? I don't know. Okay. Uh, Pogasis says, when you want to buy Ghost Scepter, when do you activate it? I see this item used much more in high-rated games than in my bracket. Well, when there's an enemy guy that does physical damage that's about to go on you or going on you, you press it. <laughs> that's that's basically that's basically it. 
Yep. Donnie, oh, Vince Scepter has a good question. He has, his question's actually coming up in Patreon, but he said in, in uh, chat, Donnie, do you have a better or worse win rate on stream? Probably worse. That's a that's a good question. I would imagine it's probably worse because I'm more distracted. But at the same time, it could be better because I try to hold my tilt in and control my emotions more when there's people watching me, so I can't just <laughs> lose my shit. Um, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it's worse just because I, I feel a lot more pressure when I'm playing on stream. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I feel similarly. I feel like... I feel like people are watching me, and I have to adhere to uh, some some certain uh, standards. You know, it's like you, you can't pick your nose on stream. You can't fart. You can't. You know, it's like you can't do all this regular shit that I'm sure everybody does. Uh, so you're you're constantly like spending brain power monitoring how you're behaving, uh, right. as well as as well as you know that if you fuck up, people are going to judge you. And uh, I mean, it's especially true. And uh, you know, no offense to anybody who, well, actually, yeah, offense, offense to you. If you if you CS lol people on Twitch, then yes, offense to you. But people will like CS lol you when you miss last hits, and that's just like a such a two to three k player thing to focus on. Right? Is is, is like oh, miss the last hit, they're really bad. Uh, but it still gets to you, and then it's like your brain starts thinking like oh, for fuck's sakes, this person's so stupid thinking the last hits matter. Like, right. <laughs> no, it's way more about strategy. And then you're thinking about that, and then somebody fucking kills you, and it's like, what am I doing? And then right. you start thinking, oh, what am I doing? Thinking, what am I doing? It's just this loop, this loop in your head, this anxiety that goes on. And I think that's a lot less likely to happen when you're when you're not streaming. Just yeah. Because the the it, the little spark that lights the flame isn't there. Yeah. Also, for me, I noticed that when I'm streaming. I feel very obligated to just like play a game and then play another game and then play another game. When I'm not streaming, I'll play a game and I'll get up and like do other stuff and then I'll come back and play another game. And then maybe I'll play two games in a row, but a lot of the time I'll like take a little break just because I feel like it. Whereas on stream, I feel like if I, if I even go get water, like my, my viewers drop, you know, that's true. That's true. It is definitely, that's also, that's also bad. Like, I have a bad back. Somebody uh, was asking in chat like why I I don't stream, and it's basically because I don't play all day. Like I I I generally take, you know, I do play a lot of Dota. I I play probably like at least five matches a day, uh, which which definitely you know compared to the um, maybe not the average Dota player, but compared to like the average gamer, that's more probably more hours of gaming than most people. Yeah. Um, but I don't play it. I don't play it all at once. I'll like I'll take a break. I'll go get tea. I'll go to the grocery store. I'll take a walk. And like I have to get up because my back is, uh, you know, I got, I got a herniated disc. I'm an old man here. Yeah. So it, that that it's just not very conducive to to streaming. You know, it's 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 like you'd call you'd have I'd do a two hour stream then I'd be done. Right. What am I drinking? It's a Diet Coke Extra, toasted vanilla flavor with extra caffeine in it. It's only available in Ontario. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> she cracks me up every time <laughs> kremlin says question one so this is a two-parter uh marana for some reason i've been spamming marana as uh, a support position five or position four is this bad to play her in support roles no i think she, i think both are decent uh is she more of a four than a five i th think so i don't know if you agree or disagree marana yeah i think she's probably more of a four than a five yeah, she's quite good at roaming, and roaming is definitely kind of coming back into the meta. Yeah. Um, I I guess I could see some scenario, like if you had a strong, stunning safe lane hero, like a Sven or like CK or something like that, but it feels very situational. Yeah, definitely. Or if you're really good at it. Uh, as soon as the game starts, like the whole sacred arrow not learned noob spammed at me in chat. I always start with Elite because Marana's arrow is so hard to sustain the mana for. No, no way. No way. Do not start with Leap. Do yeah. not start with Leap. Um, I that know sounds bad. Mana You're players. definitely not Wind Ranger. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the reason that people get arrow first is because you can arrow range creeps, which means you can push the wave, which means you can get your Leap anyway. Yeah. Like, this is this is the reason that, like, um, let's see, uh, the reason that TAs start with Psyblades first in the lane. It's not because refraction first is bad. It's because if you start side blades first, you can push the wave, and then you have both side blades and refraction. You have both. Yep. It's the reason Batriders back when Firefly wasn't dog shit. Batriders would just cut the first wave and Firefly it. 
because it gets you level two. So you basically start the game at level two anyway, but only if you level that skill that guarantees that you're going to get level two first before your opponents. So yep. Sacred Arrow is what you get first because you arrow the range creep, which pushes the wave, which gets you level two. It also lets you arrow jungle creeps. Um, and yeah, you, you should you should probably get more mana. It's it's really not that mana intensive for what it does. You should be using it to you should throw an arrow so that it's either gonna hit a hero or the range creep. And either way, that's gonna be good. Yep. So yeah, you just you just gotta look and see what pro players are doing with arrow first because that is that is one of the big reasons why Mirana is even remotely viable, in my opinion. So you you're gonna unlock if you're not going arrow first and you, you start going arrow first and you're already winning with Mirana, you're about to unlock some crazy shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. go watch what pros are doing with arrow level one yep. because it's really important. It's one of the best things about this hero. Yep. Might not have anything okay. else to add. Question two from Kremlin. Uh, is there... Uh, what's the best way to counter Sniper at super crap MMR? He's picked every sodding game. It's almost like the team with Sniper on it wins. I've noticed at pro levels he's hardly ever picked. Why is this? What do they know about how to counter him that us in the trenches don't know and should know? Uh, target, just, target him in team fights. <laughs> you just jump sniper. Imagine that. Okay, let's say you're playing a game of football. This is gonna be a terrible example because I'm Canadian. I don't know anything about football. I'm talking like American football. Okay, sure. And there's this like really fast guy on the enemy team and he just keeps getting touchdowns okay what do you do okay he's really fast but he weighs 80 pounds what's the solution you just fucking run at him with three guys and everybody takes him out you just charge him because he's a little bitch right he's fast but he's a little bitch so you just take three guys and put them all on that guy and guess what the enemy team is so dog shit at football american football that they can't win without that guy and the reason for it is because this guy that weighs 80 pounds is sucking all the energy from everybody else on his team. That's what Sniper does. He sucks in all the fucking energy and all the farm, and the entire game is about him, and if he dies, his team loses. And the problem with low-rated games is people will run their 200-pound guys at the 200-pound guys on the enemy team. They have no plan. Instead of running at the 80-pound 80, 80 guy. They have no plan in team fights. That's, that's the main difference. Like... Excuse me, sir. My football analogy was fucking brilliant. Please don't go back to, to regular Dota terms. Sniper, Refer to this in terms of football. Sniper is probably the easiest hero to kill in the entire game, aside from maybe like Zeus. But those two heroes are the exact same hero because yes. they, they want to sit as far back as possible, but they have no escape mechanics. They're very squishy. Like 80 and, HP. Yeah. And... Uh, they're so easy to get on top of. Like all you have to do is just approach every team fight with the plan, which is kill sniper. And if you don't see sniper, you literally don't go into the team fight until you see sniper. That's all you have to do. Blink daggers are good for jumping him, picking heroes like Storm, just not like Donnie said, not fighting unless you jump him. It's it's the reason that sniper is so dog shit in pro level pubs is because it is so easy to win against him. You yeah. just focus him with literally every hero, every game, and 100% of the time he will lose. Yep. <laughs> that's that's as easy as it is. Yep. It's very hard if you don't do that, though. Okay, Vince Scepter. Hey, guys, I have a question regarding team fighting as a position one. There are many games where the enemy team has certain ultimates that pierce spell immu immunity, like Duel, Fiend's Grip, and Chronosphere. Sometimes they'll only use it on you specifically. Do you have any advice when it comes to playing around these as a position one. So I would say that this this is... Uh, a lot of the time, this comes down to like proper positioning and choosing when to go into the fight properly. Yep. Like, If your whole team is around you and these heroes are dueling, chronoing, or fiends gripping you, it shouldn't result in anything because your hero should have so much net worth because you're the carry that you can actually survive these spells and your your team can't. Like if you're tanking these spells as a carry, it should only be when you're around your team and they can save you from them. Um, yep. otherwise, otherwise, like you just can't you can't play like insanely aggressively on your own against these spells. That's just the bottom line. You can't do that. You need to send manta stop uh, manta illusions down creep waves. Uh, you need to quickly push waves, play away from those heroes, things like that. But uh, if you're if you're if you're grouped up with your team, really, in, in my opinion, as a carry, like if you're using that shit on a carry, 
uh, instead of like a Rubik, like the Rubik will just steal Fian's grip or lift the guy. Do you know what I mean? Like the the, the support should be there to pr to prevent that from killing you, and they should be just happy that they didn't. They're the back lines, right? That you want stuff to be used on you, um, yeah. To some degree, uh, sometimes you like have an off laner or a mid, like a DK or a Centaur, and you want that hero to get shit cast on them. And you just go in like once stuff has been used on them. That's that's also acceptable. But it just it's just about team fight execution. That's yeah, it. I think it's a pretty big debate. I think a lot of people will go for like extra defensive items. They'll you know, they'll build like a, a Lincoln sphere against a bane when in reality all they really have to do is just kill the bane or like wait for the bane to use his fiend's grip or get nuked down by somebody else before they enter the team fight. Uh it just sounds to me like you once again don't really have a plan for going into the team fight. And you're kind of just running in, or you're constantly being gone on. In which case, it's not a team fighting problem. It's the fact that you're constantly out of position. So look elsewhere other than the heroes most of the time. I will say, if you are like a juggernaut, your your role is kind of to be like this very aggressive split pusher. And if you're against like Beast, Bane, and Void or something like that, you're gonna have a bad time. But you know, that's like being counterpicked by three heroes. Yeah, and there should be some other part of the draft that makes up for that if that's the case otherwise you yeah. kind of fucked up your draft yeah like there should be some wyvern to save you from from that and as long as you're positioning correctly then the wyvern should just be able to cast his spells yeah eleanor says hi there mid related question i had a discussion with my friends uh that they tell me i should go and fight at the start of every game for runes so i'm assuming you're mid uh, and sometimes i think that i have to block waves so that i can make the lane situation better for myself by securing the first wave and make uh, worse for my opponent but sometimes my teammates end up losing all the runes i know both of you are not mid players this is correct uh but i want to know uh, what do you think about the subject for me it's like kind of 50 50 uh, yeah i think if you're a hero that doesn't really matter like for example a zeus or just a hero that automatically wants to push the first wave then maybe going is okay but i also think it's more of the the five's job to recognize that oh i have a hero that's like self-sufficient or definitely doesn't want to fight for the rune i should go bottom or I should go top and then have three heroes at a rune, and then you can usually get a kill and take two bounties. And then maybe your self-sufficient hero can get a third. I don't think you should ever try to get four. I think that's impossible, pretty much. I Yeah, I, I, I actually agree with you. I feel like it is 50-50. Um, I think sometimes your your block does matter on the mid lane if it's some like really uh, highly contested matchup, such as like you know OD versus SF, something like that, then it definitely does matter. If it's not a hugely contested matchup and you just win the lane or you're like a melee hero where obviously you can't uphill miss as a melee hero, then going and getting the runes is is definitely uh, solid. Sometimes you can even get away with like zoning the enemies off the runes and then uh, you know dipping back right before the runes do spawn so that you have time to get like at least a half block from from your base. So it do it does depend on the games. And um, I would say yeah, if your friends are if they're telling you to go 100% of the time, they're they're wrong. Uh, but they might be right about some of those cases, just because sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes I'll have mid players that just I, I I recognize that they just didn't need to block, and we really needed help at the rune, or we could have gotten three runes. Like Donnie said, four is pretty improbable, uh, but getting three is definitely something you can do if you have the mid go, and and that, obviously that's pretty important. It's like that's that's an extra what four hundred, uh, or sorry, extra two hundred gold for your whole team. So that's a that's pretty pretty important. Um, yep. But yeah, 50-50, honestly. Yep, yep, yep. Ugachaka says, as a carry, under what condition should I pull the enemy wave to the hard camp? Uh, So I would say if the enemy team is cutting, for one, you, of course, do that. Um, if the enemy team is dragging the wave behind their tier 2, or tier 1, or tier 2, uh, then what I would say is you want to drag the creep wave not to the hard camp but to the next creep wave uh so that way you're denying an entire wave from them as well and then the equilibrium will end up in the exact same spot yep um if you can be greedy and you've some way of farming that camp quickly and getting the last hit on the neutral then i would say that's also acceptable that's also that's also good it's it essentially just depends on on how greedy you can be um you just want to choose what's going to give you the most gold. Obviously, your carry, and uh, what what usually does that is is like yeah, pulling to that camp, or it's almost never into your tower. You almost never want to pull into your tower unless 
you specifically need a tower for like defense purposes. You know, the enemy team's going to kill you if you drag it to that camp. Something yep. like that. That's how I see it. Or if it's, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking if you if you only have like a partial wave, but even then you just want to tank it outside of your tower and wait for the next wave unless it's yeah yeah definitely. Putsy McCoy says you guys gave advice about a year ago to mute enemy chat always. Yes, I play I play with that option. I did, but after getting a new PC, it's been unmuted, and I actually enjoy friendly banter with opponents at occasion. Do you stand by that recommendation regardless of your own tilt ability, or have you reconsidered this? Most streamers who have sense of humors and confidence uh, deal with this daily. I would say it depends on your mindset. Sometimes you're in the mood for it. Sometimes you're not in the mood for it. Uh, for me, when I'm playing, I'm just so focused on winning that I don't give a fuck about bantering with the enemy team. I just want to win the video game. Uh, at this point, I, I play Dota because the competitiveness of it is like what I, I really enjoy. I play, you know, I'm playing Cuphead right now for the same reason. I'm trying to do every boss on perfect. And I, I just, I really enjoy the theory of, um, you know, the, the, the theory of like, what exactly is it that I do to make this the most optimal? That That's the part of it that I enjoy. And it's not necessarily the art or the music. You know what I mean? It's like, there are elements to the game, I think, that if, if you enjoy that element, then feel free and and, you know, it, it's good for your psychology, right? But for me, it's just a distraction. So that's why I mute it. Is it's either a distraction or it tilts me. In both of those cases, I don't really care about it. Yeah, I um, I play with it on, but it just doesn't really bother me. Like the only times it really bothers me is when, oh, well, I don't know. Some, I guess, the most common thing that happens is that we're winning the game and the other team goes such and such teammate is trash and and at that point you have two options usually i tell them to destroy their items and run down mid you fucking pussies and then, <laughs> and then, and then i thought you weren't gonna add anything i was like donnie there's something extra that you would say there buddy. yeah yeah so that's what i that's what i tell them or i tell my teammates they're obviously going to keep playing so let's just play normally, which is some somewhat important to say sometimes because a lot of the time people will just kind of be like, oh, this game's over. But then, you know, the four other people will continue to play or even the five other people will continue to play. So, I don't know. It doesn't really bother me. I also like chat wheeling people when you kill them, stuff like that. That that kind of BM is very fun for me. I, 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 mute, I mute that shit. I just, I, I've yeah. always been such a shit talker in sports. I, I really enjoy that part. So that's just part of who I am, I guess. I don't know. That, that, uh, that, that sort of shit. You should definitely be able to mute tips. I think that's, <laughs> it's crazy that you can mute, you can mute chat wheel, you can mute chat, you cannot mute tips. I think that's, I think that's, that's nuts. You should be able to choose what you, what you want to see. And I mean, it just has nothing to do with the actual game. It's like yeah, just but... some added random feature that's the purely aesthetic on my screen. Is it purely aesthetic or is it psychological warfare? No, it's purely aesthetic. It has psychological components to it because <laughs> humans are visual creatures, but, you know, it's, it's bullshit. It's a bullshit way to win. Uh, anyway, Uga Chaka, fuck off, Donnie, and your dumb chat wheeling. Uh, Uga Chaka <laughs> says, do you think people that are com uh, competitively driven to play the game, i.e. to win, improve at a faster rate than people who play the game for the dopamine rush of certain events, such as getting rampages or making a flashy play. And if this is the case, do you think it, it's worth uh, nurturing your competitive aspects in order to improve? God damn, dude, that's a fucking good question. Oh, boy, what do I think? Um, Wait, sorry, can you read that one more time? I was reading do chat. You think, do you think that people who are competitively driven to play the game improve mm. faster than people that just likes the dopamine rush of mm. um, rampages and flashy plays and things like that? I think that's a very situational thing. I think that being too competitive can hold you back in a lot of cases because people will get like too into the mechanics, too into the minutia, too into the fact that they're not winning because of their teammates, quote unquote. And sometimes just be having fun will make you play better. But I do think that if you're not driven to get better at the game because you're competitive, then you will probably plateau much earlier. I was going to say, I was going to say, I actually think that people that enjoy the dopamine rush of flashy plays and things like that, I feel like that's the the group that's 
that's going to improve more. And the reason that I say that, it's surely anecdote, of course, as, as most things are in Dota, being, you know, a 20-year-old game. Most people that I that that I know that are like tier one pros or like tier one point five, they they love the rush. They love the big plays. They they love uh, theory crafting and figuring out what the best way to win this lane is and things like that. And uh, you know, there's obviously a level of competition to it. But I I can say for sure that if you are missing that love of the rush of doing really cool shit in the game, you you can't be good. You can't yeah. be like really good. So. I want to say that because of that, because of you know the experience that I have uh, knowing some of these people, is that all of them have that flashy play uh, kind of love, but they they're also highly competitive. So I would say that it's it is good to it is good to nurture both. And I was actually the opposite. I was somebody that uh, enjoyed the competition. I maybe I didn't enjoy it, but I was very competitive. Didn't want to you know be shit at the game. Sick of being a six K player. So I tried really hard to, and I, and I actually like nurtured the flashy play aspect to it, where instead of feeling like in a game where I get last pick and it's my job to win the game because I'm the last pick here, instead of feeling pressured in that situation, thinking of that as I enjoy the opportunity to basically carry an entire game and have a free game. Mm. That was a huge flip of a switch for me. Uh, because a lot of the time it's like these flashy plays and getting a rampage. This shit would give me anxiety. It was the opposite. It wasn't something that I got a rush from. It was something mm -hmm. that scared me because it's like, oh, I don't want to fuck this up. So actually, like teaching myself to to kind of just literally just thinking about that the anxiety is not anxiety and that it's just you anticipating something and being excited about it. That helps. That helps a lot. Yeah, so I actually went the opposite way. I mean, I remember from um, from my time playing baseball. Like when I went from high school baseball up to college baseball, I definitely noticed a big shift in the amount of people on my team that were like actively trying to own the other person at all moments. Like they were, they were like very excited. Like if there was a pitcher on my team, they would be like actively trying to just like make the other, like the batter that they're facing look as terrible as possible. Like that was what they loved about the game. And Those people own man. Those yeah. people are, are insane. And I was like, damn, that that's like a crazy mindset that you're actually just like, you're trying to prove that you're the best in this game, in this moment, every single moment. And I think that's what you see in people like Sumail and Thompson and, um, you know, these insane players who just constantly pull off really nuts stuff is because even if they're at like five health and they've got like, you know, two wand charges and a tango or like a two wand charges and a fairy fire, they're still going to go in because they're like, they can see that there's like a 5% chance that if they play this perfectly, that they're going to kill the other person. And if they can do that, it's going to completely win them the game. And so they're going to go for that because they're like, I'm going to make this person look so bad right now. And it's going to be the best thing that I do this entire game. Yeah. Yeah. The people that get off to that sort of shit are definitely annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty annoying to play against. Uh, okay, Snowy says, one of the very first things that you learn in Dota is that if you don't pick a hero with a reliable stun in your first two picks, it's automatically an L. In your opinion, is this always the case? Uh, examples examples might include any combination of Venomancer, Undying, Abaddon, Silencer, Io, etc. Uh, to make this question even more extreme, can you win a game with no reliable stuns in your entire lineup? Um, okay, well, back when I was a competitive Dota player, and I was playing on some, you know, Tier 2, playing in every fucking qualifier that there was and losing uh kyle would always tell our team because he thought we sucked uh he would say hey you guys should pick more stuns because stuns carry noobs like basically and I, I agree i mean obviously it's kyle so he's got this like very goddamn extreme way of of saying shit um but it but it is true like basically what he's saying and now he says it less bluntly uh that stuns carry um it's just easier to it's execute. Easy, easy, easy of yeah, ease of execution. That's what it's about. It's like easier to execute stuns, and I think that there's been like a three uh, 180 where basically for a while the top teams were like, okay, we don't need to pick stuns. We just pick a really good draft because we're good enough to execute without stuns. And then top level Dota became so fucking good, and people all became so close to the same skill level that ease of execution became important again because you couldn't just outplay your opponents anymore. It, it, it didn't because they were going to do the good cool shit as well. They were going to have good drafts as well. 
Right. So it's kind of looped back around where for a long time, I think there was a lot of strategy involved in Dota. I think there was a lot of rigorous Dude, like, flow chart stuff and it's back to all instinct now it is all instinct dude like the the, the kuroki the teams like ti7 liquid they're like coddle strat where they they like you know they're running gh coddle four they've got like a chen they have no stuns it's all about hitting a 20 minute timing around their position four is aganim scepter and ending the game like they there there was definitely a time i completely agree we're getting back to that point where the skill gap is not big enough to where execution can win you the game a lot of the time. Um, you know, Liquid or rather, Enigma still tries to do it. Like you'll you'll see them. You'll see them look really bad occasionally because they're trying to play these drafts that are like one percent drafts. Like they cannot make a single mistake the entire game, otherwise they lose. And they still draft them because that's who they are. Like that's their identity as a team. But most most. <laughs> Like OG, yeah. you know, OG won't do that. OG will give themselves a lot of chances, a lot of opportunities to win the game. I've actually been playing with some of the OG players recently in pubs because it's really cool to have the opportunity just because they're they're here for the LA major. Um, and like a lot of a lot of pro players are. And uh, I'm definitely getting the vibe from them that they're uh, you know, no tail tried timber four against mm-hmm. uh against Snapfire. And I, I asked him because I just kind of wanted to get information from him. I asked him, like, okay, well, what should I pick with that? And he said, don't worry about picking for my hero. I countered Snapfire. You countered their carry. And I picked Axe and I fed, which sucks. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought I thought that Axe would own uh, Slark. I hadn't played that matchup in a while, but it turns out Slark's actually quite good against Axe. Before, you would just spin the first wave, right. but it's so slow now, you can't do that, so he just gets level two first. Anyway, uh, but the bottom line is I, I got a feeling that No-Tail was a very kind of instinctive I'm not picking this because I've thought about it sort of thing. It's like, it's more, he just had this idea of taking a shit one day and he's like, I'm going to try Timbersaw versus Snapfire and see how it feels. Right. And he did. He just tried it. He thought about it. He tried it. It wasn't some crazy, like doing the calculations. Oh, 13% take oh, Snapfire's HP is only 300. He's not, do, he's not doing any calculations. It's just, it's just, he wants to see how it feels. And it felt bad. It, it probably, he was like, oh, this off lane is shit. So that's why it felt bad. And uh, I don't have, you know, mid one playing off lane. Actually, he was in the game. He was mid though. Um, <laughs> But anyway, you, you get you get what I'm saying. I, I, I think a lot of the top players are, are uh, very much so like instinctive players, even when it comes to like strategy and and what heroes they're picking. It's like Ana played with with his friends and it worked. So let's pick let's like pick it and fucking TI, you know? Yeah. OK, Zebus said, uh, first of all, thanks for the great content being following you for the last four months. And finally decided to become a patron. Thank you for that. Zebus. I recognize you. It's a stream viewer. Uh, first of all, oh, okay, I already read that part. Been playing a lot of Axe lately, but I have a hard time starting the process of cutting waves. You and me both, buddy. There are two typical scenarios. The support and position ones start chasing you around without the help of my own support, and it's hard to survive. The support are hiding in the trees and don't let me get into position at all. The same thing applies when my pause four starts roaming. I find it hard to contest a 2v1 lane. Any tips? Okay, I can give you a tip. Start in cutting position. Go smoke there. Go run there at the start of the game and let your support get level 2 on the first wave. Cut at the tier 3 because at the tier 3, the carry cannot run over and stop you from cutting. It is too far. The carry will lose the game for doing that. So you want to make sure that you're cutting there in those situations where they can actually stop you. Um, Otherwise, the situation where you're not cutting like that, it will be because you can actually play the lane. And then you're only going to be cutting for a brief moment, uh, you know, perhaps behind the tower for like a couple levels or something like that. But you're playing the lane normally. You push the lane, you cut the wave, something like that. But let's say you're playing Axe versus Slark, for example, which I just did, like I said, with no tail and I fed. Uh, in future, I'm going to play that lane and I'm just going to cut level two. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give uh, my support uh, level two on the first wave and I'm just going to hard cut until I have enough levels that I know that I can win the lane. And that's what I think you should do as well. At, cut at the tier three, basically. Yeah, I also kind of think the axe is just not a very good hero right now. You like? I agree. I think axe is bad. The the helix at level one is just so underwhelming. It like takes so long to kill the wave, and then I don't know. It just doesn't feel good to play that hero right now. Yeah, it's a pretty garbage hero. The offlaners that are insane are like Mars, Slardar, Still, Void Spirit, Puck, Bat, Centaur, Legion. That's about it. The other ones are garbage. Basically, people that can actually play the lane <laughs> for the most yeah. part. 
yeah, Mars is insane. Mars is definitely a big boy. Yeah. Mars and Sardar. Those are your those are your 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 big your big boys. Nature's sure. Prophet's coming back as an offlaner too. Uh, yeah, Nature's Nature's is definitely decent. I need to move Nature's up in my list actually. Uh, okay, so Rage says, "What are your criteria? Criterion? I think I think that's the uh, plural of that for making a new tier list. I saw you guys made a few tier lists for patch seven point two four. Uh, but not for position five. So I look at Dota 2 Pro Tracker to see what pros are picking. I look at Dota Buff to see what the general win rate is in all brackets. Um, and I think about my own experience in, in my own games. That's that that's basically it. I just combine those three things, and uh, Donnie and I will talk about it, and we'll just agree to a medium. Like If, if he thinks something is S tier and I think it's B tier, we'll just say, okay, it's A tier. Yep. Yeah, we, we, we basically, we generally build them together or at the very least consult each other when making them. And uh, for the most part, it just comes down to doing a bit of research and then also playing some games and seeing how it feels. He also, okay, uh, sorry, Grand Garden, next question. Um, I saw that he mentioned something about us, both of us hoarding Dota Plus shards and he thinks we shouldn't do that. And I don't know, man. I don't know how to spend these. I don't know what I can spend these things on. I've bought like everything. I've I've started buying the relics that track stuff just cuz I've been like, you know what? Why not? I've played a, a bunch of these heroes a lot. I might as well keep track of how much damage I've done through cleave on Sven. I I bought I bought a bunch. I bought all of the ones for Pudge. That's all I care about. I I, I don't give a shit about any of the other heroes. That's the thing. It's like Yeah. I bought all the things that I wanted from this and there's just not. I have all the sets that I want for the heroes that I play. Yep. They're like three thousand each, so they're not even expensive. It's ridiculous. Like I can't spend these fucking things. Yeah. Okay, Grand Garden. The real question is: Is like in position four with eggs, meme or meta? Could seem legit when paired with a good carry. I don't know about position four, but I feel like offlane lichen maybe not that bad. Uh, I thought at the start of the patch it was going to be really good, but it hasn't been getting a lot of... It's probably underdeveloped. I would say that's an underdeveloped thing. Yeah, 4 is garbage. It just doesn't do anything that the 4 all wants. I I can't yeah. see that being good. I could see maybe a 5, but most likely a 3, if you're trying to do that build. A 5 that like loses the lane. Pretty rough. Yeah. Uh, best offlane is Jestraga that says this. Best offlane heroes to start playing the offlane. I like Beastmaster, Mars, and Enigma, but it's trash right now. Uh, what other heroes would you suggest specifically to start playing the role? Slardar, Centaur, uh, Legion. I would say these are three very similar easy heroes that are basically everything you want in a generic offlaner. Mm -hmm. If you want to get a little bit more crazy, you can try Bat, Puck, Void Spirit, Pangolier, but uh, yeah, Pango. If you want to go crazy, but I would say, I would say, yeah, like basically, Centaur. Mars is great if you're a Mars player. Play that in the offlane. It's like the best offlaner right now, maybe other than Slardar. Yeah. If you like Mars, just play. It's a broken. That's a broken hero right now. So yeah, I think that for the most so part, least... just learn to play like the tanky aura slash initiator heroes. But if you end up liking the offlane i think like the people that really start to accelerate their growth in the offlane also have like these weird heroes like the pangos the nature's prophets that kind of stuff in there as well the puck those are like yeah, nature's is a it, weird one like the ones that we named earlier are, like the ease of execution offlaners and then there's like the 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 like hard execution offlaners which are the ones that you actually have to like have impact and like know your timings well and that kind of stuff yeah they can be fun. They can definitely be fun. And, and you can have a higher impact sometimes with those heroes. Yep. Parody says, is there a way to have quick cast for all items but but wards and TPs? I have no idea. I don't use quick casts. I don't think so. I use quick cast. You can enable UI to bind specific keys for quick cast under advanced hotkeys options. That's what I see. So maybe you can do it, but you'd have to have it in a certain slot. I don't know. I'm not a quick cast player. Not, not going to lie to y'all here, you know? Use quick cast. It's good. Yeah, I will eventually. Uh, okay. 
So no answer. <laughs> Sorry, party. We're used to... <laughs> Poopy Pants Boy says, Sorry, but this is a long one, but I feel like it needs some explanation. Oh boy, here we go. All right, let's see. It's been a while since you watched one of my replays, so you may not remember how I play, but I was wondering why it's easier for me to win lane against a high ancient player, which only occurs when I party queue, than it is when I solo against people in my own bracket. Uh, let's see. Okay, if you don't remember, I usually play mid, so I should theoretically be getting bitched by higher ranked players, but 80% of the time I win my lane. When I party queue, I generally have a 60-65% to 65 win rate and 53% solo. Keeps a spreadsheet, so he knows this. The people that I play with have synergized to the point where we make the same calls at the same time and have the same unspoken game plan uh, when team fights occur, all aware of our duties. That's good. I'm not leaning towards the conclusion that I'm being carried because I keep pace with our safe laner and sometimes I have more impact than them. Uh, when partied, I feel I exert much more energy into the game, more focused, because I think the game should be much harder than me for me being a lower-ranked player. Is it possible I underestimate my opponents in solo queue and lack the enthusiasm? Yes. Enthusiasm. I usually have them playing against people at 3,000 of them more higher than me. If so, how do I motivate myself uh, when playing? I would say the way the, the way that I motivate myself is that, um, you know, people like my girlfriend, for example, is telling me, like, stop playing after 3 a.m. Like, you're so dumb playing after 3 a.m., basically. Follow your own rule. And my thought process in those games, and maybe it's not great, is that I should be able to win those games. If, if I am the player that I want to be, and if I'm at the skill level that I want to be at, I should be able to carry those games. I should be good enough. I, I want to be as good as Sumail. You know, I don't see why anybody can't get to that level. All, all the, the only, there's no difference between, you know, Sumail's not a god. He's not, a, he's just a human. He just has the right motivation. He does the right things. He's good at the, you know, good at the game. Like, I, I don't see why any individual can't become like that, given the exact same circumstances, essentially. So for, for you, I would say, why the hell don't you have an 80% win rate in your solo queue? Do you suck? Mm -hmm. Like, you cl you clearly do. You're sucking in solo queue. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's fine, because that, you know, you know that you can do better. So that's just the way that I would see it, is, is as a challenge, is as like, you're fucking up in these solo queues, man. And you're so you're capable of so much more. So realize your full potential. You know, yes. you should be able to win those games. You should be able to win with idiots on your team because you should be so good that you carry them. That's the thing. That's that's the way I see it with these late late night games. Like, yes, I have feeding rank a thousands or whatever. And usually I don't play with rank a thousands. Usually I play with rank two hundreds and stuff, and they're way better. But it's like, fuck, man. If I'm gonna rank up, I should be able to carry these idiots. I don't care if there are literal donkeys on my team. You know, donkeys using their fucking hooves to play, press the keyboard. I should be good enough to 1v5 these people because I want to be good enough. Yeah. So it's nobody's fault but my own if I lose, no matter what the game situation is. That's I, kind of the way I see it. I agree. I mean, it just kind of sounds like you have a very lazy attitude about your solo queue games. You're just kind of like expecting to get better by just like pressing the play queue button. And I, I say this as somebody who has had this attitude in the past and still devolves to that attitude from time to time. And uh, it's pretty much like every time that I stop respecting my teammates and my opponents, I lose. It's very simple. So just treat every single game as like an individual event that you want to. It, it's like we were talking about earlier. You want to you want to literally own the people that you're playing. It's like own them. So make them sad to be playing against you. Make them very very unhappy and uncomfortable to be playing as you because you're so much better than them show them i love playing void spirit because that's how i feel is i can just run around the map like being such a fucking piece of shit yeah I, I love it i'm having so much fun with that hero yeah also uh to talk to party real quick um for that last question sorry i was spacing out when you read it i have quick cast and i also ward as a support player most of the time when I place wards, I am placing them manually because I want to place the, you know, like the vision circle. I want to see where that is. I want to see where the sentry overlap oh, yeah, you is. Can't, you can't do that with quick cast, can you? Mm -mm. Um, you can if you have it on button up as opposed to button down. Um, but you, one thing I will say is like, one thing that started happening to me was if I had quick cast on my mouse button, my mouse four button, like one of the side buttons, I was constantly double warding just by tapping it once. Cause like for whatever reason it would like 
double kit double cast it so that sucks yeah I, i've had to start using a different hotkey uh just because it doesn't double double cast like that and other times um i will just manually ward and i think that that's okay because manually warding is probably better in a lot of scenarios um but to to switch the uh the type of ward if you're trying to like really quickly swap to a sentry or something like that you can hold alt and then it'll double tap it agreed even though i don't use quick cast uh okay dat burrito says what makes timber saw good i saw you had him as a to your last pick but why Meta heroes, timber. It, it, timber is just really strong against a lot of the meta heroes. Uh, the timing that they get a vessel, usually you can have like a Yules or a Lotus or something. Uh, the math on his on his uh, stats and and spells are just it's just really good. People yeah. have gotten better at playing timber too. People have gotten way better, like uh, you know, cutting waves and pressuring really hard. Uh, basically, the when timber became OP was when they when they changed the armor calculation. Uh, where basically less armor was equal to the same physical resist, so armor is better, but they didn't lower any of the armor numbers in the game. And if you look at all of the uh, armor items and minus armor items, it's all been nerfed. It's all been nerfed because with the new calculation, certain ones were OP and then they had to be nerfed. Medallion, for example, went from like 8 armor to 5. Uh, Deso went from 7, I think it's 6 now. Uh, so yeah, they've, they've, they, have been, they have been changing armor but timber didn't get changed uh but recently it did but for a long time timber didn't get changed and still the numbers are, are are probably a little bit too high for for timber saw uh the moment they make it so that his level seven can't tank tier ones he's going to be dog yes but he can still tank tier ones with his level seven yeah i also do think that the hero is very easy to play against in my opinion he has he has one thing that he does very well which is to own you for 15 minutes and I would just say that probably below High Immortal, you're not going to run into many Timber Saws who are going to be able to actually execute that well. Most of the time, they'll own you for like 10 minutes, and then they'll just feed three kills in a row, and then the game is completely over. Yep, just need a vessel, that's all. Uh, Party says, I played one game in NA today at 6.5k MMR, and none of my teammates had a mic. Is that normal? Yes. I used <laughs> everyone having a mic, but not speaking English. No, a lot of people don't say shit in NA. Yeah, it's, it's really, really frustrating when you try to communicate and nobody else talks to you. You get called a mic user. People are not very social in NA. Dude, EU is crazy. The amount of people that are communicating all the time, it's fucking crazy. It's like, go, go, go do this. Oh, we go smoke, we go smoke. Oh, I need BKB, I need BKB. Like, it's nuts. You got all these Russians, they're just talking nonstop in Russian. And then the moment they need to speak to you, they know that you speak English. They just speak perfect English. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And Europeans we wonder why man. NA is such a terrible region. Master race Europeans. Uh, Sergeant Sarcasm says, as a support, uh, where are some great spots to ward on the map? A lot of the ones I've been trying get dewarded quite quickly. Okay, that is... We, we kind of talked about that last week, where we basically... The, the answer to a similar question is basically, if your wards are getting dewarded, then just put them in not shitty spots. Like, there's, <laughs> plenty of, there's plenty of places... Where, okay, one trick that you can use is everybody and their goddamn mother places sentries on cliffs because that way they don't have to send a courier out and, and deward. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you use the ward or use a sentry to see where the sentry range is around a cliff and you place a ward just outside of that, that ward will not get dewarded because people will only place a sentry on that cliff and nowhere near it because they'll assume that if they dewarded that area, it's it's gone that's that's how you get those like around the map wards uh, in the map wards i should say in the jungle wards and other than that ward lanes ward directly in the river at roche like yep. these are wards that don't get dewarded it sounds like you're just kind of placing shitty wards and these are shitty wards will get dewarded by shitty supports but if you're if you're placing good wards then only good supports will deward them and uh, then, you know, since that's half of supporting, you'll basically shoot up an MMR in, until you get to good supports. Yep. So that's that's the cool thing about it. If you do master warding, then, it, you know, it's it's pretty, um, it's pretty game winning. Yeah, it's actually pretty fun when I do run into somebody that knows how to ward because I'm like, damn, this is actually really hard. <laughs> like once every 200 games, I'll play against somebody else who knows how to ward. And it yeah, becomes and very, it's... very, very hard for me to actually keep wards on the map. Yeah. 
people some people are very good at it okay who do you guys think will win the esl major okay uh let's see I mean, Secret's the obvious choice. Sumail's an obvious... Uh, oops. <laughs> oh, shit. Just Sumail, <laughs> my, not OG. My bias, <laughs> my bias is, like, creeping out. Uh, OG. OG is a pretty obvious one, I, I think. Uh, they're they're obviously, you know, TI winners. Uh, I think Team Master actually has a good chance just because... Nah, they're not going to show up with their whole team. They have a bunch of visa issues, unfortunately. Oh, do they? Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. That's too bad. Yeah. Um... The Thunder Predator is going to get completely shit on. Yeah. EG has a chance. EG definitely has a chance. That's that's a very phenomenal team. Yeah, IG is say... really good as well. I don't know if IG's championship level good. I think they're like top four good. I would say it's like secret EG or OG. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I'm a bit North America and Europe biased. But... I would say that those are probably pretty safe. Um, I wouldn't sleep on RNG. But I don't think they they have what it takes to win either. Yeah, RNG are trash. Uh, Fnatic has looked really good at the summit, but it is the summit, and I think that this team perpetually underperforms on land because they're just really bad at dealing with pressure. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, they do they do really underperform on land for some reason. Um, okay. Destraga says, I got destroyed by Timber with Life Stealer. I suck, but how do you approach this matchup? I watch my replay and realize. I didn't trade with him while his Q was on cooldown. You just don't trade with Timber, dude. You just don't. You just last hit and and life steal. You all, the only reason you trade with him is to heal. That's it. Yeah. But like you're not gonna you're never gonna kill or push a timber out. It's literally just about last hitting. And the moment the moment he starts pressuring you in the way that he can kill you, you just leave. You just go somewhere else where the timber isn't. Yeah, just... uh, once you have a maelstrom and you have some heroes on your team that are strong, like you can kill the timber. But like Donnie said, the timber only wins for the first 15 minutes. So if you just avoid that motherfucker for the first 15 minutes, you win. A lot of people in high rated games are cutting waves versus timber because he can't kill towers on his own. He needs a creep wave. So if you just go behind a tower and cut the wave that he's pushing, he tanks the tower, sure. How many timber saw little right clicks do you think it takes to kill a tower? It's like 200. <laughs> like it takes forever. It does not going to happen. Yeah. Uh yeah, I mean just rush a maelstrom. Literally just go straight maelstrom in that. Yeah, lane. no boots maelstrom. That's that's what a lot of people do on life stealer these days anyway. Yeah. Just ma maelstrom. And then you can actually maybe kill him with like a support. Crave said, I've made my own tier list for off lane for this week, and I basically focus on never losing my lane, because that's where I feel my weakness as a player is. I would say you you can you do need to be a little careful uh only picking to your to your weaknesses. Uh, you don't want to like use things as a crutch. I've I've done that before too. That's so. I think it was God Z said that to me, and it really like hit hard when uh, I kept going back to Pudge as a hero. And he's like Jenkins, you're only picking Pudge because it gives you a crutch for the shit that you're bad at. Like I could run around, be out of position, and it would be fine because I'm Pudge and it's making space, and I would just <laughs> deny rot, rot myself to death. You know what I mean? So and it's like that's true actually. Yeah. I I need to learn. I need to learn to to not have this hero as a crutch there's a lot of players that can play only one hero and it's and they play anything else and they're they're terrible at it and it's it's because things that that one hero uh are allowing them to do as a crutch these other heroes don't you have to be good at them but they aren't and then people always go back go back to the hero it's like oh they keep losing when they're starting to learn you have to break that wall of feeling like you want to go back to those crutches um anyway that's not the question so yeah, sorry, I want to just interrupt because you saying that is just giving me an epiphany, which is that one of the main reasons I play Bloodseeker is because he allows me to position perfectly in team fights because I can I can target select and be in the right place at the right time because I move at 800 movement speed. And I I recently today I played a Juggernaut game and my jug is okay. I wouldn't say I'm like an amazing jug, but I'm an okay jug. And I played a game where I had like literal perfect team fight positioning and target selection. And I know that because it felt really easy in a game that should have been relatively hard. And so just thinking about that now, and most of it was because I was like, you know, I was like wrapping around to the right side of the fight. I was finding the people that I needed to be killing first. And on Bloodseeker, I literally just like sit there and I wait for myself to get super fast. And then I just go kill the person that I have to go kill. And there's nothing stopping me from doing that. So, yeah, you gotta be careful with that. I've been trying to learn. 
lately. Um, so he was saying that he put Underlord into S tier, and uh, you push pull with level one Firestorm. If you have a hard matchup and you're still kind of new to the hero, yeah, that sounds good. I think I think Underlord. Um, for me, I would put Underlord in A tier, not S tier, but uh, it's a fantastic hero. I think it's a really good hero. Mm, I disagree. I don't, you don't think so? I don't think Underlord's that great, but I think that he's really good at stomping low level games. I think he's one of the best heroes at massacring people in pubs because he does everything that you want at like level. It, it, he does everything you want in the laning stage for somebody who's not necessarily like that great mechanically or strategically. He makes the laning incredibly easy to play. And sure. I, yeah, I think I, I don't think say that as like a point. flame necessarily, but I just don't think I, I think he's an overrated hero. Like if, if you think he's amazing, I don't think he's an S tier hero at all. I I, th I think I think he's good. Um, but push pulling the lane is like that's a good strat. That's a that's always a good strat in the off lane. Uh, the only thing is if you do that, you're feeding a bunch of free creep waves to your opponents. So you only really do that if the matchup is a little bit hard, like you said, or you want levels. So yeah, I I would I would I would go for it. Um, I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, Sergeant Sarcasm says, what is a good way to pick replays apart? Some issues can be uh, quick to find, but a lot of the time I can't figure out where I'm wrong in thinking on certain plays without getting someone else's opinion. Uh, when they point out, it's blaringly obvious, but when I watch it myself, I tend to miss a lot. Stop being uh... bored and watching your replays. Watch them actively. Like I would say, like, a lot of the time I go into a replay with I know that I fucked up in the game at a certain point, and I want to see like the circumstances around that. Yeah, you know, I'll be like, I died at this point. Like, how can I avoid doing this? Oh, there's a ward in stock. If I just sent a ward out, I wouldn't die here. Like, why am I not doing this in every game? Like, you need to go into the replays with an idea of what you're gonna look at from the games. You can't just like, okay, I'm gonna pick a random replay and see all the shit that I lost. Like, do it when it's fresh. You know, do like write down notes from the games. Like, hey, what do I want to improve from that game? Like, what is it that I actually fucked up? And then and then go into the replay with an idea of like I want to get more information on this subject. That's what I would say. Yeah, I I think that. I mean, it's, I'd I'd say that like learning to watch replays is a skill that you have to develop because I think it's just way less fun than playing the game, and it can get really boring and dry if you're not like actively trying to get better at learning. And as soon as I as soon as I got like to the point where. I was like really curious about what I was doing wrong. Replay review got kind of fun, but I can understand why you would uh, probably not feel like you can learn anything. Cause you'd probably just like scrub through and you're like, Oh, I died. Okay, cool. That was bad. And then you go to the next thing. And you're like, Oh, okay. I died here. Okay, cool. I won't do that next time, but there's no like actual questioning of yourself or, or analyzing anything. Yep. I agree. That's it. We're done. Dope. Great no stream. More questions. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. You guys are the best. Except yeah. for you, Hockeyleaner. You're not very good. Everybody else is great. You're a piece of shit. <laughs> um, yeah, this has been episode 70. Thank you again for tuning in. We will see you sure. next week. Oh. Hello? No, nothing. Huh? Uh, just, what? I'm just hanging out. Just okay. relax now. Great. Well, go enjoy yourselves in your games. Don't binge queue. Don't lose too much MMR because we only allow people who are winning MMR on this stream because it helps us, you know, get more clout in the Dota community if everybody who watches us is winning more. So Yes. If if, if you suck, get out. All right. See you later.